Okay, that looks like it's working. Okay. We got the audio coming out in and out all the wrong places. Um, there we go. Okay. How is everyone doing? I'll start in a few minutes. I just made a coffee. I think there's a couple of people that want to join, so I'll, I'll hang on a bit. <clears throat> I did a stream. Can you actually hear me all right? I'm getting better at muting my mic while I drink things, so it doesn't go blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> but not perfect. Okay, so my, my plan is basically today I want to um, carry on from where I, I spent ages last time doing um, set up the different compilers for different operating systems and today I just want to do um, a little bit just coding. So last time we did Hello World, um, very simple printing out and explaining what the different lines did and today I want to carry on from that, which means starting a new project with a new file. I'm going to do it just in a text editor so people see it's nothing special. Um, yeah, I'll just hold on a minute and see if anyone else joins. <clears throat> Is anyone alive there? Give me an ahoy in the chat if you're actually listening. <clears throat> I am trying to do it a bit earlier in the day than previously because there are people in uh, Russia, Eastern Europe that were like, no, t uh, 9 p.m. Dublin time is way too late. But it might be too early for Americans. Ahoy! Okay. Well, I think I can just start. So I like to start, um, last time I talked, to, I don't know if you saw the last one, but I basically set up a um, compiler and we talked about what a compiler is, why you need it, and that ran from the command line and I'm just gonna use GCC. Hopefully you can install some sort of compiler of some sort. Um, if you can't, you can work on a web page. Um, so if you Google for um, C compiler online, uh, I think the first one that comes up is this one here and it's perfectly okay to do everything here so I was going to start today um, I could in fact use this but I was going to start today with exactly this I'll start with hello world again do a little bit of a repressure um, so the idea is that uh, we have a function we have to write called main um, just to recap um, and that executes when the program starts and inside the contents of a function um, you have imperative order, it's called, so one line at a time executes when you run your program, starting with printf, ending with return zero. Um, printf is a function you're executing, you haven't written that, it's written in a library somewhere, which we get access to by including um, this header file. Um, I'm just gonna dig up a website there. Uh, I think it's cprogramming.com. No. It was cprogramming.com, I just spelled it wrong. Okay, so if you want a reference of what's actually in um, 
the different standard built-in libraries. This is a pretty good website. You can get a book. Uh, there are some nice books that list that are little um, pocket book references for lists of all the stuff that's in the basic um, functions and libraries that come with a programming language when you set it up. And it's worth getting that. I prefer having a physical book as a reference because you can just sit in a park somewhere and skim through and go, oh, I didn't know that function exists. So I'll use that next time. Um, I think that's quite nice, but this anyway has a pretty good list of, it's got tutorials, but it's got a uh, function reference. So you can find all the functions that um, you might want um, to use. It doesn't have printf here. There must be a, a subsection. Uh, it's a partial list, okay. Um, There's also C, I think it's called um, C++, and C++.com is pretty good for both C and C++. Um, and actually on the left hand side you have a column there that lists all the basic stuff you can do. So this might be your better reference um, and you will find everything in here. So if you want to know about printf. Um, we looked at man pages last time. This is probably easier to read than a manual page. Um, and it gives you nice examples and all that kind of thing of how you might use it. A little bit of discussion, they have forms and stuff. And you can see similar functions that you might be interested in. And once you've found something, um, the idea is when you want to use a function, you can look up and see which header file you want to include. This is a C++ reference primarily. So the formatting is ever so slightly different. So on the side panel here, it says include, this is the header to include, C, S, T, D, I, O. That's from C++. For C, you want to include um, the option of the parentheses that we used, S, T, D, I, O, dot H. Um, and it will list actually all of the other functions in there you might want to use. Um, so there's fprintf, which we talked about briefly, which is a, a file printing version. Um, so this is a nice way to find out about functions that you haven't used before or you see something somewhere and you want to go look it up. This website's pretty good. I think cprogramming.com is pretty good as well from memory, but um, this may be easier to find a reference of everything in there. Um, so anyway, today I wanted to talk about, so I, last time we just talked briefly about printf and what a string roughly is and ha um, how to call a function, but it would be nice if we were able to make our own additional function um, and invoke that or call that ourselves from our program. So maybe um, we can make something up here and we talk briefly about the syntax or the, the layout for a function. Um, so you have a return type, a function name, um, parentheses, and then any parameters or inputs to the function, parameters, uh, then opening brace and the contents, line by line, and then a closing brace. And so we have that for main, you can see there, the return type is int. We um, talked about that briefly, that's an integer. It's one of the many types you have access to. You, d you have a small, actually a small list of types. We, we had a brief chat about that last time. Um, so we're gonna make our own function. Um, and it would be nice if we could do something like have a function that adds uh, a couple of numbers together uh, like a really trivial thing, you wouldn't need a function to do this, but maybe we can have a function that returns the result of adding two integers together. So I'm going to call this adder is the name of my function. And I'm actually going to give it two parameters. So I want to give it like integer a and integer b, and it should give me back the result of adding those together. So you can actually have a list of things in here that are variables that are inputs to your functions. So I'm just going to type this up and then we'll have a look at how it works. So I'm going to go in A, so I'm going to give it an integer. So you give the type first. So it's type and then variable name. Um, so integer A and integer B. And if you've ever done algebra before, this is basically a use of algebra. So instead of giving it the actual value of a number, I'm representing it could be any number that I give it. And I'm going to refer to that as A. Um, <clears throat> so inside here, we're going to do some mathematics. And we're going to say, OK, let's make another variable. I'm going to call this integer c. Um, and that is equal to a plus b. Um, so you can see that we're doing some basic mathematics. You have those built into the language. You have equals for the assignment operator, it's called. Um, so that will create a, a new place in memory for storing an integer. I'm going to call that c. 
and I'm going to add two inputs together. So the, the two values we're going to give to this function when we call it, it's going to add those together and you've got some basic mathematics operators you can use. You can use plus, um, minus, forward slash is for divide by. So you can divide a number by another number with forward slash. Um, you have a remainder division. So the modulo or modulus operator is the percentage sign. So if I went a percentage b, and we'll look at maybe have a go at this later, it would uh, divide a by b and return the remainder of the division. So that's quite helpful um, for certain um, things we want to do. Um, right now, it's not going to be very useful. Uh, if we want to multiply two numbers together, you can use the asterisk, which is above the 8 on the keyboard usually, depending on your keyboard layout. So if you hit Shift-8, you'll get the little star asterisk, it's called, and that's used for multiplication. Um, those are your basic operators. You can use whatever you want. I'm just going to use plus for addition. Uh, remember that this little double forward slash is a single line comment. So that was originally from C++, but newer versions of C can use it as well. Um, <clears throat> okay, now if you remember, um, or if you look down to main, you can see that because we have a type that our, we've said that a, we have a type our function is supposed to return. If we didn't want it to do anything, return any value, we could have void, but we do have a type. We have a type of integer. So we have to use the return keyword there. Um, so I'm going to say return C. So I want to return the value that's stored in C. Um, and that's it. So that is a function definition. We have not used it to do anything yet, but we have written our own function. It's got the same layout as the main function. Um, we've given it a different name. Remember, main is a reserved keyword. You must have one and only one function called main. That is the entry point to your program. So when your program starts, it will not stop, start up here. It will not execute this stuff at all. It will start at the first line within main and then move down to the second line. Um, so if we want to add two numbers together and then perhaps print the result out to the terminal, we can do that now. Um, and print after your call here is a way of calling a function. So we are similarly to what the layout we've got with our adder function. <clears throat> we're invoking or calling a function called print f and we're giving it an input to the function as a parameter and that is a string called hello world. And then print f will go away and it knows how to grab our input and then um, spit that out to the console so we can read it. So we want to do that again. But um, in our case, we're going to use the function we just made. So we're going to say uh, adder, and maybe we want to add one, the value one uh, and three together. And then, of course, we finish any statement um, in C with a semicolon to say that's essentially the end of the line or end of the statement. Um, <clears throat> So we're executing a command here, which is a call to a function. And it's saying, call my function using exactly the same name. Don't use a capital letter because the programming language considers this a different word. If you remember, um, we talked about ASCII when we were talking about strings last time. And if you recall that, and in fact, I can bring up the ASCII program, the capital letter A in ASCII has the value decimal value of 65. And that is a different number to the small letter A, so the lowercase letter A is 97. As for all intents and purposes, they are different characters. They're completely different letters as far as the programming language is concerned. So do not mix up lowercase and uppercase letters. <clears throat> um, so you'll find it helpful to form some kind of convention about, hey, I'm only going to use lowercase letters for the names of things. And if it starts with an uppercase letter, it has some special meaning. Um, if you start mixing and matching, you're going to forget and mix it up. So right now I've called a function and I'm pretty confident it's added two numbers together. And you'll see I haven't written A in here. It does a substitution for me when I call it. So when I put the one in there, it will match that up to the first argument and go, okay, hopefully someone's given me an integer here. If it's a, a different sort of type, it'll probably complain. Um, and I am going to use the value one, substitute that in, and now everywhere I've got the, val uh, the uh, variable named a in here, remember it's like algebra, I'm actually going to be using the value of one there. Um, so when I do my int c equals a plus b, it will be using one, the first argument to the function, the parameter and an argument are the same thing. Um, so I might use those words interchangeably. So the first parameter or argument is one, the value one, 
is going to be used for a. And so a is going to be added to the second parameter, which is the uh, variable name b, but I've actually given a value to it here when I call it. So it'll be going 1 plus 2 and storing the result in c, right? So that's when I execute this, the order of lines that are executed. And it's important to always keep this in mind. You start at the first line in main, print f, hello world. The second line in main is a function call. And um, that's our function, so we know that it's going to execute this. But what happens with the, remember this is concept we called control flow, which means start at the top, work to the bottom. When we get to a function call, in fact, that includes printf, um, but adder is a function call, it will jump the control flow to the first line inside that function. So we will go down the page until it gets to a function and then jump to the first line and it will literally jump to the first line um, it will actually create an instruction most of the time called jump to do that. So we'll look at assembly code later where you can see how this works. Um, and it will jump to the first line in that function. It won't do anything with this. It's just the name of the function. Um, but it will start executing here. And then follow the same procedure down the page. So that line, then the return statement. Now, there's something we've missed here. And it's like, okay, we have... Um, added two numbers together, but what happens to the result? So we haven't done anything with the result of adding two numbers together. Um, how do we capture that? Uh, and actually, it looks very similar to the way that we've got this format here for adding two numbers and storing the result in a new variable. So we can say, int, and then that's a type declaration. So we're saying I'm creating a new integer uh, and I'm giving it a name. I'm gonna call it result. You can call it whatever you want and then assign the value that is output by this function or returned from this function, assign that to a new variable. Um, so I've now captured the, whatever C, the value in C is, it, C no longer exists at the end of this function, um, but the value that is returned here is stored in a new variable. So um, I can now write a print statement, print F, and I can do, if you recall, we, I showed you how to print a value from a print F statement. Last time, if you're not sure how to do that, you can type in man3 printf in the console on Linux, or you can look it up here. Uh, printf is just here somewhere, printf. Um, so, or you can look it up in a book, and you will see plenty of examples here. So um, this particular printf is printing some um, numbers. This one's printing characters. And you can see this these special tags here, the output of what that would look like is shown below here. So if we want to print uh, the number 1977, um, we can use percent %d. You can also use percent %i for that. I prefer using percent %i to percent %d just because it lines up with the word integer. It doesn't matter. Um, you can use whatever you like uh, of those two. So percent %i or percent %d will let you print not a word, not a string, but substitute in a variable. So we did this briefly last time. I don't know if you recall. So I'm going to say percent %i. Um, oops. Uh, the result of adding, um, what did we have? 1 plus 3 uh, was given as, and then I'm going to go percent %i. And that won't print as percent %i in the output, but it's expecting us to go comma at the end of our quotes, at the end of the, the closing quote for our string, and give a variable name. Uh, or a number. We could put in a number like they did in the example there. But I'm going to say, I want you to print whatever was in result. Um, I'm going to say, actually, our two numbers. And then remember, of course, semicolon at the end. OK, I think that should work. So we can compile it. And if there's any little mistakes, the compiler should tell us. Um, I think I go run, and it will both compile for us and then run it. So it says, hello world. And then on the same line, the result of adding our two numbers was given as 4. So we just do a quick double check with our test values there. 1 plus 3 indeed should be 4. So that looks like it's giving us a result. Um, so the first bug we've come up against is, why is this all on one line? I'm sure that I wanted these on two separate lines. So I want the result to start on a new line. Maybe I'll give it a capital. And it's because up here in the hello world in the sample, they didn't have what we had in our example last time, which is a slash n. And if you recall, that is one character. Um, we write it as two, but it actually gets stored as one character in a string. And it has that code for line feed or 
bring us down to the next line. It's basically replicating what an old-fashioned typewriter would do. Um, I don't. A lot of people these days have never seen a mechanical typewriter uh, or have never used one. Um, so if I think back to the 1980s, uh, my mother had these kind of things at home. So you would be typing um, a line of text, and then when you finished the line, you would hit return um, or enter, which is the same as a computer keyboard, and two things would happen. Um, you would have, first of all, the carriage, which is the, the little thing that carries across the page and actually prints your letter on the paper. That would zip back to the left-hand side where you want to start the line. So that's equivalent to the cursor if you're typing in something in a terminal, right? So that's the carriage is the name of that little printy guy that zips left and right across the page. Um, and then you would have to do a thing called, and it would go bing more often than not, and then you would have to do a thing called a line feed. And some of this was mechanical and built in, so it would do them both at once, but sometimes it wasn't. And there was a little dial on the side of the typewriter. You would have to manually twist it so it moved down to the next line. It would go clunk, and then you'd be one line down. So there's two things that happen there when you're typing on a typewriter, right? So you get line feed and carriage return. Um, I'm just going to make a note here. Carriage return, go to the start of the current line. Uh, and then line feed, uh, scroll, the scroll down to uh, the start of the next line. Right? And you need to do both those things. Otherwise, if you only do a uh, line feed, you're going to be typing on the end of where the last line finished. If you only do a carriage return, you're going to be typing over where the text was last time. These days, um, and you'll notice these names actually line up here. So if we looked at our uh, ASCII table there, you might recall that the name of this little combination character here, slash n, remember that's one byte value, that it's both of these things um, uh, represent just one byte or one character in ASCII even though we type in two here. Um, and if we looked that up, we actually got the result of that last time, but it equated to the value 10, which is LF, which stands for line feed. So that has ASCII value of 10, or the character is represented as slash and N together. Right, we also have carriage return. So on some systems, you do actually need to do a carriage return as well as a line feed. Um, a carriage return is in here somewhere. I believe it's this one here, CR. Uh, and that's value 13. Or the character code. And remember, the slash means it's a special controlled code. So it does something special. Um, so slash R is the carriage return. So you could, if you wanted to, do both here. So we could do slash R and slash N, and then we could be absolutely sure that that is going to bring us down to the next line and move the cursor back to the beginning. Oops. <clears throat> yes, okay, that looks like it worked. So we got hello world on a completely separate line there. Um, so these days you don't need to do this on most systems. You can just do slash N, which is why I've just been doing slash N. Um, I think Windows in particular was, is still picky uh, at the end of lines in, in that it looks for your slash R and slash N. So if you ever save a text document that you've opened and was originally saved on another system, your text reader might go, oh, this has got Windows or DOS line endings. Do you want me to save it with Unix line endings instead? And that's what it's whinging about. Um, it's You've got two bytes on the end of a line as opposed to one or the other way around. Um, it doesn't usually matter. Most text readers are just not going to complain about that. Um, but it might ask you what your preference is when you go and save it again. And, and that's it. So um, the neat thing you can do sometimes on, I don't think it really works anymore, but older like MS-DOS programs, if you run them in DOSBox games and things, they might have a, a progress counter that they print out the same way as we're printing stuff out there, right? But instead of um, printing out and then going to a new line, it would print um, some little indicator of progress. It could be a little bar that fills up with text characters, or it could be a little um, a slash that spins around between forward slash, hyphen, backslash. Um, and in order to make that look like it's animated, they'll just do carriage return. So it, basically, you're writing over the start of where you were previously. So you could literally go 
um, instead of hello world, you could do printf something like this as a kind of, um, and then you could maybe say uh, 0, 1%, right? And then as you're, you've processed more, you maybe you're installing a software off about 3,000 disks or something like that. Um, what you would do is, oh, sorry, I wouldn't say anything there. I would just say like that and print it out. And it would appear, and then what you could do is go, okay, next time, I, now that I've, you, you know, somewhere in here you've done more processing, installed more stuff. Uh, and then further below you could say print F, and then start with carriage return, which brings you back to the start of the current line, right? And then you can update your progress here. And it might be that you're now at, as long as you have exactly the same number of characters that you're overriding, it'll look fine. And you can say that you're, maybe you're now at 11%, right? Uh, and then in here, you can draw some stuff. So I don't know, maybe you got X's or something to show a little bar starting to grow. And that was a neat little um, command line trick you could do by manipulating the carriage return. But it only worked on some operating systems. Um, so I, I think that's kind of useless now, but a nice little piece of trivia. Um, we can see what happens if I print that actually. Oops. I keep hitting uh, Control S to save and it goes a little bit bananas there. Uh, oh, sorry, I've done the percentage sign, but of course remember that was a control or a formatting queue that a variable is coming. So if I want to just print the percentage sign itself, I need to go, I, we did, I think I made the same mistake last time. We need to go slash percentage. And you see it's even colored it because this text editor knows. Um, that it's a special character. I still have one, I think. Is it slash percentage? It might be percentage percentage. Um, I don't think that's right. I thought it was slash percentage, but I could be wrong about that. Yeah, okay, that actually looked like it worked. Um, so I, it printed this, and then actually, because I went slash r at the start, it's actually overwritten that entire part of the line and written the second part. So that did actually work. Um, I, I probably need a slash n at the start of this to make sure it's on its own line. Right? Can you see that? It didn't print the 0, 0,1%. Um, it's printed, and to do a percentage sign for some ridiculous reason, you need to do two percentages to print the one percentage. Um, there you go. See programming. Um, <clears throat> Otherwise, it gets very confused. But um, yeah, it did actually work. So you can do carriage return. It may only be a quirk of this web console thing. Um, I don't really not sure that works everywhere anymore. The last time I tried it, it was a bit of a mess and, and really not reliable for making an, an animation. Um, yeah, OK, so print F. I got totally sidetracked there. Um, but we've managed to print our result. I wanted to talk about um, variables. So um, yeah, a variable, if you're Basically, what I wanted to make sure is like the second time you write something of a little program, I would put this in a new folder, um, start with Hello World, then modify Hello World. That's a great way of starting a new demo. Um, and then you've got a set of things you can go back and look at later. And it just does one thing. So this is just um, folder number two, how to write a function. Um, and folder number three might be something else. So well, fo functions and variables. So um, basically, the idea is I want to make sure you can do some sort of program that's approaching what a calculator can do. And that's a nice starting point. So um, we can do all sorts of stuff like that. And in fact, we didn't need variables for this. If I get rid of result here and literally just write one plus three, so you can write the whole uh, arithmetic expression there directly, it will work that out for you. And it will store the result in a single value and it'll substitute that single value in there. Um, so you don't actually need variables for this program. So look, it's still saying equals four. So that's fine, but it's a nice concept to use. It's a little bit like if you've got a calculator and you go, um, you know, you're working out your accounts for the month or something and you go 100 plus 0 0.04 um, and you've got a running total. And then if you, it works out the result for you, puts it on the screen. And then if you just go plus four, it will add four to whatever the previous result was. And what that tells you is the calculator has some running memory. It can hold on to a value. It doesn't just work with the current things you're plugging in. 
So you want to be able to do that in your programs, and variables give us the power to do that. And we're not limited to one or two bits of memory, like you might have on a calculator, where you go, you know, all clear or whatever to get rid of things. You can have a load of variables. You can have as many variables you can come up with. Um, you're not really limited there. So um, we can do some more of this sort of thing. Um, in fact, if we go, um, so there's some interesting data type things to talk about. So if you remember um, the basic data types we have access to in C, so these are the data types. Um, so we had the first thing is void, which is a placeholder or nothing, nothing here. Uh, or no type yet. Um, we'll come back to that uses of void uh, perhaps next time we look at programming things. Um, you have, of course, int for integers. Uh, and remember, they can be um, negative, zero, or positive whole numbers. So nothing with a decimal point or a fraction. Um, and you will recall that an interesting property of, um, and I, I should also put out there, uh, mention there that usually 32 bits large. Um, and half of that range is used for storing negative numbers and half of that range is stored for using positive numbers. And so the large, probably the biggest number you can store um, is gonna be roughly two to the power of 16. I've used caret here to mean to the power of, um, which sometimes is used for that notation. That will not work if you type that in in C. So this is not an operator. You want to assume you, uh, means power of when you're doing plus minus. You would not add that to that list there. It does something else. Um, so that's the largest number you can store. And um, we can actually try doing some negative numbers. So let's make another function. Um, let's do um, subtract. Um, and it, it's a good idea to play around with all this stuff um, to get a, a hang, the hang of it. Um, remember, you can have the braces any way you want. You can put them down there. You can put them, line them up. You can put them on the end. It doesn't matter. Um, and I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm not going to make a variable called C. You don't need. We didn't need to do that. It mu it's often nice to do that before you return something is put it in its own variable. So if you're coming back later to check the value of something, you can check it in the function. And you might find that handy. It's just a little extra tip for later. But if you're fairly confident you don't need to do that, you can go, OK, let's just return the result directly. A minus, oh, B, sorry. Um, so we have now I have a function to subtract. We don't need a function to subtract things. Obviously, this is an overly simple example because um, you can just go A minus B directly. So you do not ever need a function to do this. Um, but I thought it was easy to, to grasp. Um, so we can print uh, another result here. So if we make another variable for the result of subtraction, we cannot give it the same name because we already have a variable in this function with that name. So I could call it result B and have a new variable with a different name, or I could reuse this variable. It will lose whatever value was stored in there and a new value will be assigned into it. So let's reuse that. <clears throat> There's not any particular advantage of doing one or the other. Um, I'm going to subtract, let's say, two, let's say 11 from 2. Um, OK, print F. Um, the result of subtraction was, and then again, percent %i. Remember, you can have percent %d there instead if you prefer that um, more of a traditional approach. Um, OK, so the same format again. Remember this order of instructions. It'll do this line first, then this line, then this line, and following down. I'm going to get rid of this carriage return stuff because um, I think it's getting in the way a bit. Um, OK, I think that should work. So we'll first work out. It'll make this function call, jump into the top of the adder. So our, our control order, and it's worth doing this when you write a program, is to do what's called a walk through your code. And what that means is you'll have this parlance or this way of uh, use of words, walking and stepping. A walk means you're going to go through how your control flow will execute very slowly. And in your head or on paper, it's a good idea to do this on paper, work out what the values of variables and calculations are going to be. And then if your program's doing something different to what you think, 
you might have to have a rethink about why. And that's often the best way to find problems in your code, is literally slow yourself down and do a walk. And what that means is one statement or one step at a time. So you can use the word step because you're doing a walk, right? Have a think about what it does. So our first step is int result. So that is declaring a new variable of the type integer and assigning the result of this function to it. So our first thing that gets executed is not int result. That doesn't do any actual uh, execution of code. That is just waiting to receive a return value. So the first thing that gets executed is we jump inside this function and give it these values. They're substituted into A and B. So if you're doing a, a walk on paper, you would write down um, adder a and b and put the ver the variables in columns so we're in adder first and then a and b so a is set to one and three is uh, b is set to three right so that's the first thing that's happened the first step uh and then we jump in here and this is the first line that gets executed actually is a plus b and the result is stored in c okay so i'm going to make a new column here called c um, and actually, the number of the step is over here. Oops. All right. And this is step number, uh, I'm going to call it one. You can start wherever you want. Um, so step number one um, and step number two. OK, we've got A plus B is stored in C. So four is now the, 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 the variable stored in C. OK, and then we return C which means our control flow goes one, two, and then jumps back to this line. And this is the next part that happens. So I'm going to call that the next step. So step number three, we have a new variable here called result. Uh, we're no longer in adder, actually. Um, so I'm actually going to remove this. Uh, that might get a little confusing later, but I'll say why. Um, so the third thing that happens is that the result, the value that was stored in C that we returned, is going to be stored in this new variable here. Um, so I'm not sure if this is too small to read, so I'm going to zoom in a bit here. So, um, okay, so four is now stored in result, right? So step number four it is that we are coming to, let's drag that down. Um, this, again, same kind of pattern. We're now starting a function called subtract. We're going to call that, which means jumping to the first line in here, but we are... Uh, storing these two values and these two variables, all right? Now that's interesting because we had variables with those names already. Does that mean that these values are stored in the same variables that we're using up here? And the answer is no. Um, so when you open a function, any variables that are declared in the function die when the function finishes. So every function has something called a scope and scope is easy to detect and see because it starts with these curly brackets. Scope starts here. And then scope ends at the end of the function. That applies to every function. And pretty much everywhere you have these braces or curly brackets. And what that means is any variable that you have declared, and that means created uh, with by giving it a data type and a name, that's a declaring a variable, when you have done that, and that includes this top line here. So we've declared the variables A and B, and later in the function we declared C. None of those variables exist anymore in memory when the scope ends. And what's actually happening is in the memory of your computer, you have a thing called the stack. And every time a function is called or invoked, it creates a new frame of memory on the stack. And all the variables that are declared in that function go in there. And when the function returns and you exit out of that invocation and back to whatever it came from, so it will jump back to where you called it, that scope, uh, stack frame is closed. It gets popped or removed from the top of the stack. It's gone. All that memory is no longer reachable. Forget about it. So if you try and access C in here inside main, it won't know what C is because it's only alive within the scope of this function. Right? So the same goes for we have variables inside main called good morning november dev uh, inside the scope of main we have it starts here and it ends here however you might think okay we have this result value here surely 
the scope of this function can see this one because it's you know main is the first function obviously that gets put on the stack right the variables that are in main's uh, scope are not accessible from other scopes um, there is a way to do that uh, which we will look at later but for your basic use cases like this where we have a function calling another function inside it those variables belong entirely to one function. So adder will not be able to use result. Um, if I try and use it in here, let's try and run that, it will complain. It'll say error, result undeclared. I would need to make a new variable inside this function um, for me to be able to use something called result. And it would have no connection at all to the result variable I have in main. Okay, so that's variables have a scope. That is a very important concept to programming languages in general. So variables hold data, values, and numbers. Um, variables are declared uh, given a type and a name and variables belong inside a scope. Okay. Hello, Oscandra. Um, right, and we can tell scope, usually tell scope by braces. If someone has actually correctly put braces everywhere. You can get away sometimes by not putting braces. Please try and put braces at the start and an end of a function or anywhere you think they might belong. Um, so that is one way to tell scope. Uh, and each function has its own scope. So therefore, variables declared in one function are not available in another function even if they have the same name okay so that brings us to the next point so we have a control flow and it jumps to the start of a function that's called and when you get to a return statement or the end of a function um, it jumps back to the previous function and you continue from where you left off so we did adder we stored the result of adding two numbers in a new variable, we printed that out. So that's another function call. We don't define that function, it's defined elsewhere in a library. Um, we've printed the value, the integer value of our variable, and we gave it that name. This is where we declared result. So note that result is declared here, okay? So the point we got up to when we were doing our walk is here. So I don't know if I closed off that comment at the bottom. I did not. Let's do that. Okay. So the next point we get to is we're subtracting two numbers. And they are also going to store uh, the returned value in that same variable called result. Um, we cannot have two variables with the same name in the same function. Um, so if I went int result to try and declare a second result and tried to build that, it's going to complain again. Error redefinition of result. So we can call it something else, or we can reuse the same variable. I'm going to reuse the same variable. Um, OK, so what's happening? We're jumping up to the control flow is jumping from this line up to the first line in the function. And the value 11 is being stored in the variable a. And the value 2 is being stored in the variable we called b up there. Now, the interesting thing here is that we also have a scope for this function. And it starts here and it ends here. So these are absolutely not the same variables in the same place uh, in memory um, that the adder function had. Even though they had the same name, they have no connection at all. We may as well have called them something else. Do not get confused by that. So I could have called them uh, subtraction A and subtraction B, and it would be exactly the same. Um, OK, so do not think that you can access a variable from some other function. Um, now, that gets interesting, because in our walk, what happens? So obviously, it's not storing those values in the same place that we stored the other values. So actually, I'm going to say step four, A and B, and no more. So that is the end of the scope of those 
variables. Once we return from the function where they were declared, they are dead now. There is no more A, there is no more B, and there is no more C. Um, so the variables, the values that were stored in those are gone. Um, we've, oh, okay. Get auto completed something there for me. Um, result still alive because result still exists in our main function and that's still on the stack of functions. It's still going to be returned to in our control flow. So if we're on this line here, we now have to consider, okay, let's do a step here where we actually add these new variables. So we have actually completely new variables called A and B. We don't have a C anymore. And I'm just going to make a note here that these are from the adder. Um, this is from main. And these two here are from subtract. So we have three different functions, and actually, they can't talk to the variables from the other functions. And these ones are all gone now. Once the adder function is closed, everything there in memory is gone. It's lost entirely. Um, if we call at the adder function again, it'll recreate those variables. They will have nothing to do with the variables in subtract. Even if within this function, we were to call adder with a and b, guess we're now actually giving the same values to the adder function, and there will be a and b over here. They will have nothing in common with these variables, so there's no way for them to get mixed up in memory anywhere. Okay, so we're actually creating new variables a and b. I'm not doing it on the same column because I want to make it clear that they're actually completely new variables. They just happen to be called the same thing. Um, and I've got 11 and 2 in those. <clears throat> okay, so the, the next step I'm going to add here is what's happening there. We've got a return keyword. Now, that's a built-in keyword you will call. Um, okay, I just noticed the alignment was different in these functions. Um, not that that matters. It's just a style thing, but I wanted them all to line up with one indent inside a function. Um, okay, so what happens first? Do we return to function first? No, we're actually going to execute this expression first. So there's some mathematics there. It is going to take the value that's stored in A and subtract from it the value that's stored in B. And it doesn't store that in a variable. We didn't make a C this time. It just returns that value. Um, so I'm not going to write that down anywhere in my, in my table of variable values. Um, and when I come back here to line 33, the result of subtraction was, well, actually, we've captured the return value from that function over here. So I'm going to add a step there. So step number six is result, which I'm reusing. And I am putting that in the same column as where I had result previously, because that is the same variable that we used before. And that is going to store 11 minus 2, which is the value of 9. OK. And then that's, I think, all the interesting stuff we're doing. After that, the result of subtraction was, uh, and then it'll print that out. I'm not going to write anything in my table for that. And then finally return zero, which is the end of the um, scope of the main function, which is now the only thing on the function stack. So um, we finished subtract when it returned, and that popped off the function stack. A and B are gone. They're completely gone now. So actually, I could have done an intermediate step there. So I'll call that six, that seven. And just to make it clear, these are now dead. They are gone. Um, and finally, um, everything that was in main is gone as well. So we're going to wipe result. And that's also gone from memory. So that's quite a nice method, actually. Doing a walk and writing it down on paper is a nice method of getting it clear in your head what values are stored in different variables and what's actually happening in the control flow. Because now I can reproduce what I think, what my mental model, my on paper model is for the control flow. I've got eight pretty clear steps there. I know that the first thing that's going to happen is this function will be called and jumped into. We'll jump up there. And you can see one after the other, we still have this imperative one step, next step, next step, next step, really clockwork stuff. That's how computers work. Um, so all of this like functions and up and down the page doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't, it's really only superficial. It's for our um, clarity or benefit or being able to reuse a function more than once without retyping the code. But that would be exactly the same thing as if we had have just copy pasted this in here. Um, 
and just copy pasted this in here. So exactly the same as the contents of the functions, um, we'll get the same result. And in this case, our control flow is exactly one line after the other. There's no jumping around at all. Um, so that's, yeah, I, f I feel like that's an important concept to get right. Um, so functions are quite useful. They're a nice way, if you've got a really big complicated function or you need to repeat the same calculation several times, usually they say the golden rule is don't make something a function until you've copy pasted it and repeated it three times. So that's a nice kind of a guide or a heuristic number you can put on something to say, at this point I will split it out into a function. Sometimes it's nice just for clarity to give it a name for an operation. Um, but it's easy to get carried away making lots of little functions like these that are trivial and don't do much. Um, and then it's harder to follow the control flow. And when you need to fix a problem, something doesn't work, you do need to pick through and either use a tool called a debugger that will help you do this on, in the computer. And I feel like there is a debugger built in here too, or write it down on paper. And I really strongly suggest figure out how to do debugging by writing a walk down on paper first, because that helps you build a mental model you're not just dependent on some tool pointing your nose at the where the problem is. Um, so if you've ever got an issue where something doesn't work the way you think, do a, a walk through one step, step two, step three, what are the variables called, put each variable in a column, what are the values, really, really helpful skill. Um, <clears throat> once you've got that down, you can start using tools to do things. So let's see if this builds and then fix any problems. Okay, that worked. And it actually matched up to what we expected for the, the end result there that we printed out was nine. So that's perfect. Um, we can try swapping these numbers around. Let's do a two and an 11 and run it again. I said it was only gonna be half an hour, but I'm almost an hour already, so I'll finish shortly. So the important point there is, yeah, if you subtract 11 from two, you're gonna get a negative number. So remember that integers can be negative. Um, <clears throat> what if we want, um, uh, an integer that stores a bigger range of numbers. What if we want to store up to the number, um, use all 32 bits for positive numbers. So let's say um, two to the power of 32, which is like four billion and something. So that lets you talk about quite a large range of values within one number. You can do that. You can use all of an integer only for positive numbers. And so you no longer have to spend half worrying about storing negative numbers. If you're absolutely sure, you're only gonna use it for positive numbers. And you're almost always wrong because someone will subtract a value from it eventually and it'll go crazy. Um, but you can type in unsigned int as a type, right? And that is, um, the sign is the little plus or the minus on a number. So what that means is we don't have that here. We're not gonna worry about that. Um, that's only positive values in an integer. And that could be useful for two things. One, it gives you access to more, a bigger range of numbers. Uh, and two, it communicates to whoever is reading your code that you never intend this number to be negative ever. Um, <clears throat> so what I can do there is if I replace a result, now this is gonna get interesting because we are now subtracting a large number from a small number on the second function. Um, so that is gonna do something crazy, but it should work just fine for the first addition. So addition's only gonna be positive for us. Um, so now the formatting here in the printf is expecting an integer, but now we have an unsigned integer. So there's actually a different code for that. It'll probably still work because we're looking at small numbers um, for the positive number, but the negative numbers probably going to show us an incorrect result. So if you do percentage sign u, it will print an unsigned integer, or expect to print an unsigned integer. And print f use percentage u. Um, and print f use percentage i or percentage d. Okay, let's see what happens. It's going to be wacky. So the first number has given us four, um, and that's fine, right? Um, that's exactly what we expect. So for adding small numbers together, absolutely. Unsigned integer is fine, integer is fine, doesn't matter. But if we're subtracting things, and I wanted to show you this just so you're really careful with this. Um, if you get into the negatives and you can't store a negative number in a positive only unsigned number, right? What happens? It's reported the result of subtraction is not minus nine. It's now 4,294,000 
294,967,287. That's obviously wrong. And why is that? Well, it turns out what it's done is wrapped all the way around. So, um, and this is not something you can rely on either. So different compilers may give you different results for invalid um, arithmetic. But um, <clears throat> what it's done is it's gone, okay, um, what's the number below zero? So the lowest number we can store in an unsigned integer is zero, right? And the biggest number is two to the power of 32, which is, now let me get two to the power of 32. Uh, what is that exactly? Uh, where is a calculator? Calculator. I should know this off the top of my head because it's come up a lot, but I don't because I have a terrible memory. Okay, so how do I do? This is not going to work. It is. It is. 2 to the power of 30. No. Oh, that's the power of 2. That won't do. Advanced. 2 to the power of 32. Let's see. Yeah, so there we go. So that's the biggest number you can store in an unsigned integer. Um, that is 4 billion something. Um, so what it's done, that is now the biggest number you can store, and the smallest number is 0. What it's done is it's gone, okay, minus 1 from 0, and it's gone to this number. It's gone all the way around and looped back to the biggest possible number it can store. And then it's gone, let's subtract another 8 from that. So I think it'll be like 84 or something. Um, what did it actually say? It's something close to that. I might be off by one or two there. Oh, 87. Okay. Um, right, but it's looped back around. Um, I think I got my maths a little wrong there. But um, yeah, so that's what's happening. So you need to be really careful with unsigned versions of types. Okay, so that's your basic functions, your basic variables. Um, what happens if we move stuff around. So maybe you don't like the fact that you've got your functions up the top of the file, right? It would be really nice. Maybe you'd prefer the layout if these things were down here. Um, what's going to happen? It's not going to work. Implicit declaration of function. And the interesting point there is the compiler works a little bit similarly to how you execute code. So it also starts reading the file one line at a time. When it's compiling your program, it starts at the top line and works its way to the bottom. So when it sees this first line here, it's going to actually copy paste in. So this is the, actually the preprocessor will do this for you. It will copy paste into your file the contents of this file. And it, that will tell it, hey, heads up, you can write a function called printf. You can write a function called fprintf. Uh, you can do file reading and writing. All the stuff that's in that header, which you can go and look up here. Uh, in this website, c++.com. Um, they'll have the C stuff in there too. Um, it will list, paste all of that in. And that, that means when you get down to print F here, it knows actually, oh, I already know. I've been told that I'm allowed to use this function called print F that looks like this and accepts this kind of input. Um, if I comment that out, it'll complain about print F as well. If you remember, we did that last time. Implicit declaration of print F. So it's the same problem. So what we need to tell it is, hey, I want to give the compiler a heads up that I have a function down here called adder and sub another one called subtract. And when I use it in main, I want you to say, yeah, I've defined it further below, but for sure you're okay to use this. It's not an undefined function. So when it comes down here, it can you can promise it that you're gonna give it later a definition of something called adder, right? So what you can do for there is, uh, in the same way we can declare variables, you can also declare functions. So I'm going to say, okay, I am going to declare a function called adder that looks like this. And then end in a semicolon. You don't define what's in the function, you just give it the return type, the function name, and any of this parameter stuff. So any arguments or parameters that you're allowed to give the function, that is your declaration of adder. Um, and it must be defined somewhere. So that will let you use adder, and it probably will stop complaining about adder, but it still says implicit declaration of subtract. So you can probably guess we can just copy paste this top part of the function, put it up here, and it's a little heads up to the compiler. As it works down the page, it'll store that in memory somewhere. Okay, I know I'm gonna have defined later because I've been promised by a declaration that there's a function called subtract that looks like this. And now when it sees subtract down here, it hasn't worked down the page yet. So it hasn't got to the definition. 
um, but it'll allow you at this point to do that. So it won't say undefined number, uh, undefined uh, implicitly defined function. It won't complain about that anymore. But what happens if we forget to define something? We've given it a declaration. It's got to here. But what happens if we get rid of this? I'm just going to cut that out and then run and compile it again. It said, oh, undefined reference. So it actually got past here and probably all the way to the end of the compilation. And then um, there's another stage after you compile things called uh, linking. And that basically matches all the functions up to their definitions. And if you've got more than one file, it'll go looking in all the other files for the appropriate definitions. And it said down the bottom there, I have a linker error. And that means it's basically not able to match up different functions that you've used in your program. And it's saying, hey, I, I compiled everything and I was never able to find, the compiler compiled everything, fed it to the linker, and the linker was not able to find this function you promised me. You declared it up there, you said it was going to be defined later, and you never declared it. And that's what it's complaining, undefined reference. Um, so that gives you a few options. So you can declare functions. These are function definitions. They can go anywhere in your program as long as they're not within the scope of another function. You can change the order around. It doesn't matter. You can have one up here. And as you've probably guessed, you can actually put them in another file as well. It doesn't matter. You can lay it out whichever way you want. Um, and if you've been following along, the key idea with programming is you have a control flow. Starts at the top, works the way to the bottom. But when you call a function, it will jump into that function wherever it is. It doesn't matter. Okay, that's kind of all I wanted to do today in this like part two. Um, you have other types of variables. So we looked at integers. Um, you have uh, floats for decimal numbers. Um, if you want to play around with this later, um, see if you can make a float and print that out. Um, so these are like your decimal numbers or fractions. If you recall, we talked about that briefly. If you want to print those out, they're also 32 bits. Um, but the decimal point location will move around. It'll float around to optimally fit the number you want to store. So you can actually end up storing very small numbers and very, very large numbers. But it does lose some precision when it does that. So they're not very accurate. Um, I'm just going to make it out not very precise. Good enough for most things. And if you want to use that in printf, use percent %f. So have a play around. See if you can make some decimal numbers. I can give you a hint here that I can say float my decimal number um, equals 11.2. And you, you have a decimal point there, or a punctuation mark. Um, and then if you want to be absolutely explicit and tell the compiler it's a float, put an F at the end. And then semicolon. And now you've made a floating point value. And you could do the same kind of mathematics with those that we did here. But you cannot easily mix and match. So try and keep only floats if you can. Um, if you're adding two numbers, make sure they're both the same type. Um, otherwise, you might get some very confusing results. And we can look at how to do that um, clearly later. Um, you have doubles. Um, those are double precision floats. So you now have 64 bits. Um, did you put these streams on YouTube? Yeah, I have I have uh, the last um, intro to coding on YouTube. I spent about half an hour at the start explaining how to install a compiler for three different operating systems. And unfortunately, the setup time is a pain for C programming. Um, uh, the link, you can find all of those if you scroll down to the bottom of the Twitch page. There is a stream schedule here link under the what are you doing panel. Um, if you can see that. And if you click on that, it goes to my like stream schedule. I'm trying to link all the videos I do there. So I've only done one intro to programming, and the others are just play around with game development stuff. The same kind of programming. So if you want to see what you can do with this programming, if you learn a bit more, that's all there. And at some point later, I'll do an introduction to 3D programming with C, um, which is the language I prefer using for 3D graphics. I think I'm like the only person. Um, but uh, yeah, you can use C, you can use C++. They're almost interchangeable for most things. Um, okay, doubles, floats. And the other thing you might want to do is have Boolean types. Um, so you can have a bool. And that was originally a 
Uh, and it just came up there with a little reminder about the, the differences, different ways of doing that, actually. So the built-in version of bool from the latest versions of C is actually this one here. Um, but I don't like that, that's ugly. So I'm not going to use that. I would rather use the same bool type that C++ uses, which is just be under uh, lowercase b o o l. Um, and these are true or false values. So um, Boolean algebra is a, a branch of mathematics, or Boolean logic, um, that deals with truth values, yes or no, true or false. Um, and these things weren't in C originally, they were in C++, but now you have access to them. Uh, if you want bool, which I almost always do, then include, hash include, another standard library called stdbool.h. <clears throat> You don't need to do this in C++, it's built into the language, but if you want that same keyword, and that's the way I like using it, then hash include another, doesn't matter which order you do these things, bool, uh, my boolean equals true. And you can, literally the words true and false are fine there. Right? So those, those are boolean types. And I'll show you perhaps next time how you can use those to br uh, do interesting logic in your program. Um, yeah, okay, I'll avoid doing that now because we've dragged on a bit longer. Um, I think that's about all you need to get started, actually. Um, what I'd like to do, if I uh, hopefully that's followable for most people. So... The key idea is like when you're learning, try and make a series of folders and do like, or a series of files and do one separate file for each thing you're learning. So last time we did hello world, today we did functions um, and variables. And then next time what I was planning to do was maybe, so we could do um, loops and arrays and if statements as well, perhaps. So that's something you can do with Boolean algebra or Boolean logic. Um, and then after that, possibly at the same time, depending on how long it takes, um, I want to do reading and writing files. And I really, really like as an early programming exercise to get away from printing text in the terminal and create an image. So outputting an image from your program, you will programmatically design an image with some cool colors in it. And I'll show you how to do some fancy stuff with that. Um, that's pretty much it. I, I guess the other thing, if you want to play around, uh, absolutely do that. Make some new files that are like, here's my play around with trying out floats. Here's my play. And then go and read a little bit about what you can do with them. Um, absolutely, that's the way to go. Um, if you want to do some interesting mathematics stuff that's more than plus, minus, multiply, divide, um, there is another header. Um, for some ridiculous reason, it is called math.h. Um, I, I'll come back to that later because it gets a little bit more involved. But then if you want to do a power of two, um, remember, don't use the caret symbol for that. That means something else. Um, we might discuss later with bit manipulation. But if you want to do a power of two, there is a function in here called pow. Um, and it is under the math.h header here. So if you look it up on cplus.com or in a book, you will find that. Or in the man pages, you can remember... If you're on a terminal, you can type in man space three for the programming pages, and then pow is the name of it. Uh, and that will tell you how to use that. It says hash include math.h, and these are the different variations of the function for different data types. So there's a float version, a double version, a long double version. <clears throat> it's also telling you to link, and that's why I wanted to avoid talking about this now, because that's a little trickier. Um, but maybe we can do that next time. And that will let you work out a power. So if you wanted to work out what's two to the power of 32, you could use power to do that. And you could give it, so I'm just gonna copy that and paste it in. Um, we'll see if it works in this web browser thing. Uh, float um, result pow. I'm not gonna use result because I can't reuse result here because this has a different data type. And remember I said, don't mix them up. Um, so do not use an unsigned integer for the result of a floating point function uh, or comparison. That would be very confusing and return the wrong thing, most likely. Um, so I want to go, okay, it takes two inputs. 
they've called it X and Y, that means nothing to you. It's just telling you, give it two floats. So I'm going to say, I want to get you to return the result of 2 to the power of 32. And I've put 0 0.0 to make it really clear. I'm giving it a float and F at the end to make it really, really clear. It will still work. It will still fix it for you and turn it into a float if you give it two integers. But I like to be explicit so the compiler can be lazy. Um, and then I'm going to make another, just copy paste this. I sent F for a float, and then my variable is called result pal. And let's give that a run. Let's see if that works. Um, yeah, look at that. So the result of, oh, um, 2 to the power of 32. The result of 2 to the power of 32 was, and it's given me the correct answer there, it looks like, for um, the result of that. So that should match what I have in the calculator. Um, yes, it does. All right, so that's how you can do interesting mathematics. Um, yeah, that, that's worked in the browser. If you're on the command line um, and you're compiling that in GCC or something, um, I can copy paste this and do that real quick. Uh, I already have a file here. Copy paste that in a text file and save it. Remember, make sure it's a plain text file, not some rich text format or real screwed up. Um, when you compile it, I'm going to open a terminal. If you're not familiar with this, go back and look at the previous recording for the previous stream. I talk about terminals a bit. So if you're on the command line, uh, gcc main.c, and then what it was talking about there in that linking with lm, um, to do that, you can just go dash l, which means, hey, link something, and m, which means the math's likely. So that is what you have to do. Otherwise, it will probably complain. So that worked, and then I can run it. It worked the same way as the online version. That's great. If I get rid of LM, it might complain. It didn't. If you're really strict, it usually does. Yeah. So if I compile it with Clang, Clang said, hey, I can't find the definition of this PAL function that you've tried to use. Um, and that's because it is defined in a library. <clears throat> and for some reason, the maths library, most of the standard libraries, you do not need to tell it, by the way, hey, Linker, use this other library. They're all built in. For some reason in C and not in C++, you need to tell it explicitly to link in the math library. I don't know what the deal with that is, but it's a thing. So you need to go dash LM, and then it'll work. And then that's compiling it with both GCC and then Clang. Both worked, same result. That's what that's all about. OK, I think that's kind of everything I wanted to talk about. Does anyone have any questions or anything about functions and variables? I know I flew through the stuff. I haven't done the you know, the lecture in great detail about what it all means. Um, but hopefully that's at least something to play around with that you can now go and replicate this yourself and make some mistakes, try and make as many bugs and break things so that you can learn the limitations and do actually try adding an integer to a float and see what happens and print that out. Um, and that should give you a better understanding of what you're doing. But yeah, if anyone's got any questions or you want to chat about anything, I'll be around for the next little while. <clears throat> I haven't just been on mute for ages, have I? good. I'm trying to get quite good at muting while I drink stuff so it doesn't go wah, 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 while you're listening on the stream. Um, I'm kind of good at it, but occasionally not. Okay, well, I guess that concludes the stream. Um, has anyone actually tried doing this while I've been talking and replicating some of this either on the browser or offline? Um, so if you've got any bugs or anything, if the compiler is reporting any errors, you can paste them into chat and I'll have a look.
right away if you want. <coughs> um, the problem with compilers is they often don't tell you what the problem is. They'll tell you what a range of stuff they couldn't do is. And so you've got to use a little bit of Sherlock Holmes intuition to figure out what the real problem is in your code. Often it's forgetting one of these guys. So if you're writing a function and you forget to type in a closing brace, I had this problem today, actually. And crazy stuff will happen. So do try and break it, um, and you'll learn about some of these errors. Scope ends here. Error and function adder. Well, I actually found that one, which is nice. I had one today where I think I had an extra one of these, um, and it got really confused. So, okay, that was pretty easy to find. It even told me the line number, main.c, which is this file, line 45. So that was pretty helpful. Some, sometimes it's not. <clears throat> I think it's a, there's a save button here, which is kind of interesting. I haven't tried it yet, but it should give you this file. So if you want to download that and run it on your computer, I don't know if it gives you the built file as well, but there's no reason you can't just like select all and copy paste that into a text file <clears throat> um, and then compile it in your favorite system or with a compiler on the command line like I did. Um, I'm working on a Linux computer today. Uh, last time I was on Windows so I, I do like to be able to show you things so you can work on any platform. <clears throat> Cool. Well, I guess that's stream end. Um, yeah, thank you for putting up with me uh, coding at fast pace. I hope that was at least followable anyway. Um, but I'll, if you've got any requests or want me to go back over anything, just give me a shout later and I'll put it in the next stream.